Welcome to the core at Westside Community Church. This is part five of Pastor John's message series, Destroying the Destructive Cycle. Let's join him now as he begins. Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter uh, four tonight. John chapter four, verses one through 30. We're gonna start with uh, verse 18 and we're gonna work our way through. Uh, Kyle, thanks for praying for us, buddy. So it is 7.15. We're going to take a break in about 30, 35 minutes. Um, we're, going to, we're going to be pushing some scripture pretty hard tonight. So you're going to have to be on, on your uh, little toes. Um, you got your outlines. That'll help you. Uh, this is part four, and we've been talking about the destructive cycle. And as I've explained to you guys before, we're, we're learning and understanding that the destructive cycle has a play in our lives. Um, you can be doing well in one area and, and, uh, or well in two areas, and one can be going the wrong way, and it can mess you up. And you got to take care of that stuff. I'm, I'm here to tell you right now, if you are in the process of realizing something's wrong with you emotionally, something's wrong with you spiritually, uh, something's wrong with you physically, why are you not doing anything about it? Why are you not addressing it? Why are you letting it slide? And I have a feeling that one of the reasons why you come out week after week is uh, simply because you know you need to do some work on one of those areas. Tonight is critical. Tonight is here. It's in the area of spiritual. We're going to talk about spiritually sinful. What happens when in our, um, our journey to discover more about what God has for us, um, that sin enters our life, and we have to, we have to grapple with that. Uh, please do me a favor. You type Ayers. Don't read nonstop that second page I gave to you because we're going to read that tonight as a close. I, I want to make sure all of us leave here well-educated to what sin looks like, what justification looks like, and what repentance looks like. My fear is some of us have been living in the dark, and we have assumed that we are doomed uh, because of sin. The devil has lied to us, and that will be unacceptable from here forward, okay? So um, let's look at verse 18 of John chapter 4, and, and we'll jump into it. This is about spiritual uh, sinfulness. Uh, she said, I have no husband, and Jesus said to her, the fact is you've had five husbands, and the man you live with now is not your husband. We talked last week about the fact that how difficult would that be to be called out and, 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 to, and, and to have this address given to you about the fact that um, you've been down this road five times. You've been married and divorced, and now you're with another man, and there is potentially the implication that the one you're with now, you're living with, and he's not even your husband, but he is somebody else's husband. You're living with a married man. I mean, this woman is absolutely uh, wrecked by the fact that Jesus calls her out. And we said last week, remember, I want you to know this. Jesus does not point his finger. He's not judging her. We do not read in any one of the inflections of the original Greek that he is, he is, he is chewing her out. He is simply one-on-one. -on -one. It is Jesus sitting on the well uh, or near the well. And this, this woman, it is about noon. And he's simply addressing the fact that there's sin in her life. And, and, and you say, well, John, how do you know it's sin? Well, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, and you have a little blank there, uh, for, all have, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How many have sinned? All. Okay, remember that. For all have sinned. Uh, our sin comes from our sin nature because of Adam and Eve's fall in the Garden of Eden. When, when Eve took of the fruit, Adam took of the fruit, there was the fall, sin entered, they were expelled from uh, the Garden of Eden, and from that time forward, we have wrestled with this sin issue in our fallen nature, in our flesh. And, and there is something within us, it is the Spirit of God that resonates to draw close to Him. Um, we got to get to Jesus, and in an attempt to get to Jesus... Um, we know we need to be saved. Salvation is at hand and, and is needed. And so when he says to her, um, you have had five husbands and the one you're with now is not your husband, he is addressing uh, a sin issue. The Bible tells us, um, and I, didn't know, I don't even know, on mine I, I, I left off the, uh, the uh, heading where it comes from. It's from the gospel mark. Does anybody have, did, I, did it fall off yours too? Did it get hid behind the text box on your little outline where it comes from? Jesus answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And Jesus went on to say, and if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Uh, do you have the text for that? It, it's, it's, uh, it's Mark 10, I believe. Um, I believe it's Mark 10, verses 11 and 12. Um, but if anybody finds the answer and it's different, uh, whisper that to me at uh, the break. I will give it to the group. I will look smarter than you, and you'll get $5. But anyways, there it is. Uh, <laughs> you 
guys don't laugh tonight at all. There's no, there's no humor in you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. You love me. Okay, so there it is. Has um, anybody had a different answer? Is that what it is? Okay. So I, I want you to see this. I, I want you to note right off the bat that, that this is an understanding that we have. And Jesus is not just addressing the fact of the Jewish culture. If a man divorces his wife and remarries somebody else, it is called adultery. And there's only one way that can happen if there was a sin of sexual nature on behalf of the other one. Uh, then, then it is clear. But this was kind of culturally for the day. So there is potentially the implication that this woman is involved in at least one, if not as many as five, and as much as six different known sins. Um, you ever have a known sin versus all the unknown sins? You ever have a sin that you've done and everybody else knows about? I love all the pious people that assemble on Wednesday nights. Um, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, there's some things you do that others know about, and, and, and they know it's a sin thing. I mean, you, you struggle in a certain area, and it's led you to sin, um, and, uh, and yet there's, some, there's a lot of unknown things that nobody else knows you have that you grapple with. Um, she's got, she's got uh, five or six of these, okay? I mean, they're pretty well known. Jesus is calling her out. Uh, we know according to the Samaritan religious and cultural history this would be the same for her culture, okay? The Samaritans were referred to as pagans by the Jewish people, but there was a religious sect among the Samaritans. There was a well-known um, relationship to God. And in Sychar, the city that she is from, that we know she's from because Jacob's well is located nearby there, we know there is a cultural sensitivity to God, okay? Samaritans, by the way, even though the Jews call them pagans, folks, they are referred to in the Bible continuously in the Old Testament. God placed uh, Samaria and four other, uh, or, excuse me, five uh, groups of people in Samaria, and it's in, I believe, 1 Samuel chapter 24. I'll have to find that for you. I'll, I'll get that for you tonight. Um, actually, uh, 1 Samuel, no, let me, let me not just try to wing it here. Yeah, in 2 Kings chapter 17, you can look at this, 2 Kings chapter 17, I'm giving you a little history here. We're going off track for just a second, but I want you to get this. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 24. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 24. This is where Samaria starts. It says this, The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, uh, Kutla, Ava, Hamath, and Sheparavim, and settled them in the towns of Samaria to replace the Israelites. They took over Samaria and lived in its town. When they first lived there, they did not worship the Lord, so he sent lions among them to kill some of the people. <laughs> I just love God's justice. Did you catch that? If you don't see the humor of God, I love, let me read this again. Some of you are just so dulled down tonight, you don't even catch the humor of God. Uh, this is verse 24 of 2 Kings 17. It says uh, that they took over Samaria and lived in its town. Five, five groups of people took over Samaria and lived in its town. When they first lived there, they did not worship the Lord. So the Lord sent lions among them and killed some of the people just to get their attention. You know, we have call, uh, telemarketers that harass us. They had lions, okay? If you want to get close to God, send a lion into the camp. It goes on. It was reported to the king of Assyria, and the people deported and resettled in the towns of Samaria and do not know what the God of that country requires. He sent lions among them, which are killing them off because the people do not know what he requires. They repeat it twice. I love it because they're a little shocked. We don't know what he wants. We don't know what he wants. And they're freaking out, okay? Uh, <laughs> we don't know if God wants it or the king wants it. In verse 27, the king of Assyria gave this order. Have one of the priests uh, you took captive from Samaria go back to live there and teach the people what the God of the land requires. So one of the priests who had been exiled from Samaria came to live in Bethel and taught them how to worship the Lord. Okay, so we know that there was a God, small g, that they worshiped in Samaria, but we also know there was the Lord, the big God, the big L, the big G, the big J, okay? So I just want you to understand that. So when we talk about this tonight, let us not be critical in nature and say, well, Samarians were pagans, and we know that from, from the New Testament, and there was no God. They didn't know who God was. Yeah, they did. They had a God. They knew the reason why I'm going into great length there is I want you to understand that she had a sense of right and wrong. Um, we had a great defender. Where's Miss Joan? Joan's not here tonight. Joan always sits in the front row. Oh, there you are, Joan. Why are you on the second row? I know you are. I didn't even see you on the first row. There's two empty seats. 
Miss Joan was a great defender of our, of our beautiful lady when we started week one. And, and Joan definitely wanted us to understand culturally the divorces and that kind of stuff. And I appreciate that, Joan. Um, and, and we were trying to grapple with, you know, whose fault was it, whose fault wasn't it. But when we get to five, four or five divorces, we know that something's probably got to have uh, going on in her life. And, uh, and so I'm not here to point fingers at who sinned and who didn't. I just know there's sin. And we know according to what 2 Kings 17 says, and according to what Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, uh, adultery is a sin. Okay? So we got that started, right? You good with that? Now let me, let me, just, let me walk you through this, because this is what sin does to us, and I want to make sure you get a good grappling on this before we cruise on. The next part of it says, uh, she had fallen short, back to Romans 3.23, she had fallen short of what I refer to as her personal standards. That's the first blank, personal standards. She had never intended to live this way. I do not know her. I have not emailed her. I don't get texts from this woman from Samaria. She didn't have a Facebook. But I promise you, you tell me what little girl grows up and plans to be married and divorced five times and live with a married man. I mean, you know, she has some personal, there were some personal standards, okay? You can't tell me the first time She married a man and got divorced that somebody didn't speak into her life and say, hey, can I help you? I mean, what happened there? I mean, was it his fault? Was it your fault? Do you need to talk to somebody? That second divorce, that second marriage, when it ended, you can't tell me somebody didn't come up to her and say, hey, come on. I mean, what can I do? How can can I help you with this? Man, you're struggling. This is hard. This is two two shots you've taken here. Uh, By the third one, somebody... Uh, somebody has to probably be saying something or have they given up on her, I don't know. But I'm gonna tell you right now, there is no woman here, even in this room, who sets out as a child, an adolescent, dreaming of the day that she is about to be married, dreaming of the day that she is, whether she is given as a bride to her husband or whether or not she is, she is uh, uh, you know, raised to marry a certain man or she is courted in the appropriate way and thus married. No way in the world does she have a personal standard to say, hey, I hope I blow this one in the first 14 months. I want to marry another guy for two years. I don't want to get divorced there. I want to marry another guy about six months after that, live with him for three years in marriage, divorce him, be single for four years and say, I'm done with men time meet Mr. Wright, marry him, that'll be my fourth man, and that doesn't work out in two and a half months because he's got a problem, I'm going to marry the fifth man, and I'm going to prove to my mama I can make it happen and get divorced. There is not a woman who sat around and said, that's what I want for me personally. I want to understand this, that for her, she knows she had fallen short of that personal standard. You ever been there? You ever, you ever find yourself reoccurring, making the same mistake, the same error, um, that you know you've fallen short of a personal standard. I mean, you had said to yourself, I will never, um, nobody in my family ever, uh, my morals are better than that. I will, you'll never find me making that mistake again until you do it again. So she had fallen short of some personal standard. I, I have great compassion for her. Um, I, don't, I don't see anywhere in here where this woman intentionally set out to hurt herself. Secondly there, you see that she had fallen short of her cultural standards. Her cultural standards. Adultery was not acceptable to the Samaritans. Um, it, would have, uh, it would have been shunned upon based on the fact of, of, of serving the Lord our God, according to Mark chapter 10, as well as the God they served of that day. There, there was pagan gods that they would have been serving in that, in, in that day and age. And again, a marriage was a covenant. It was a covenant that lasted. One of the things that we have a problem with in our culture today, we no longer look as marriage as a covenant. We look at it as an agreement. The marriage agreement. We don't look at it as the marriage covenant. And so it, it, it doesn't carry as much weight. If you understood what a covenant was, I think, I think, we, I think we'd make a lot uh, slower decisions in the beginning than we do now. We, we would not rush ourselves headlong into relationships, nor would we rush ourselves out of them if we truly understood the covenant. The covenant, God's first and original covenant that he had with mankind was that man and woman shall leave one another and be cleaved together and let there be no separation of the two. That was an original covenant. We refer to the covenant that he had with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapters 12 through 16. But that covenant originally was in marriage. This comes back from the big days, the early days, guys. 
And so culturally, she would have had the same thing. Number three there, religious standards. She had fallen short of her religious standards. Divorce was unacceptable. Adultery culturally was unacceptable, but religiously, divorce was unacceptable. You, you just wouldn't divorce somebody. And then the final one, God's standards, to live a pure life without sin. Um, she had to have known of that, and we know she knows about that, because what we see next, that's going to happen in verses 19 and through 21. But so we see the personal standards she'd fallen short of, the cultural standards, the religious standards, and God's standards. And, and here's the deal. Do you find yourself lining up anywhere in there yet? Do you see any telltale signs of maybe your own behavior? Are, are you seeing some little uh, antennas going up and going, oh, wow. We know all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm okay if all of you have fallen short of the glory of God. I just struggle when it's me. See, when I, when I miss... Um, some of the personal standards I've set for myself, and then I find myself falling short of it. That's hard to grapple with. And then culturally, um, I, know what my, I know what my family, my culture that I'm around, the, the people I grew up with, our culture expected of, of me. And when I fall short of that, that's tough to deal with. Religious standards, I know what Christianity expects. I mean, I, I've read enough of the Bible. I've been around church. A lot of us have been Christianized enough to where we know what's, exp- and when you fall short of what you know your, your religion or your religious uh, standards are, and then when you fall short of what God's standards are, those are tough to grapple with. When sin has gotten, gotten its hold on us, um, I don't want anybody to walk out of here defeated with your heads hanging. I want you to read the bottom verse there from Romans. Romans chapter 8, verses 35 and 39 says this. What can separate us from the love of God? I am convinced. I underline that because you need to be convinced. He is not sure of it. He is convinced. He has not thought about it. He is convinced. He's not been told. He is convinced. He says, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, nor present, nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, he says, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from what? The love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So folks, bottom line there at the bottom of your page is nothing can separate us from his love. Here's the deal. No matter what your sin is, no matter what you've done culturally, personally, religiously, socially, whatever it might be, nothing that you and I have ever done sin-wise separates us from his love. He loves us. We're his creation. Don't ever forget that. Flip your page over. Okay, so we're moving on here. I, I want to show you verses 19 through 24, and then, and then we're going we're gonna to move to um, a little exercise, and, and, uh, and then we're going to take a break tonight. Uh, verses 19 through 24 is interesting. So Jesus has just confronted their sin in her life. What, um, what are you prone to do when you know there's sin in your life, whether it was pointed out or you discover it? I mean, do you, do you uh, embrace it? Are, are, you, are you prone to embrace your sin? I mean, do you realize, well, I, I certainly have fallen short there. I certainly, committed. I mean, do you, do, you, do you rush headlong into it or do you find yourself doing what she did in verses 19 through 24? Look at what she does. I like this woman. She says, sir. Remember, she don't know who she's talking to, right? Sir. She's being polite. She didn't call him, hey, you Jew. She said, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. She gives him prophet status. That's really cool. That's nice. I mean, he gets prophet status. Prophet status would, it would have been pretty awesome, believe it or not. I mean, she is respecting him as somebody who knows a lot more than the average Joe. He called her out on the five husbands. She's not wearing a badge around that says, I've been married five times. So she thinks he's a prophet. I like this part. Then what she does is she does her, her best to seem intellectual and spiritual. Do you ever try to spiritualize away your sins? Do you ever try to justify those? Well, I had a right to do that. They deserve that. I know it was wrong, but God is my witness. They deserved it. You ever do that? No, you guys are too good. I realize I'm with a good people. I, I knew that. I thought, you know, we're either going to be with a bad crowd tonight or a good crowd. And this appears to be a good crowd, other than, ev- uh, other than the fact that every other one of you is bad. <laughs> it just depends if you start on this end and we go, bad, good, bad, good, bad, good. And then we go this way, bad, good, bad, good, bad, good. So you'll get it anyways. Okay, so here it is. Our Father, you were bad twice, my friend. Uh, she says, look at her dissertation. She says, our fathers, 
<laughs> worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place that we must worship is in Jerusalem. Look how intelligent she is. She's watched the History Channel of Samaria. Jew, Jesus declared, he says, Jesus declared, believe me, woman. I like that. It is almost that we have gone south, okay? For just a moment, we are in uh, somewhere down south, Kentucky, Alabama. Believe me, woman. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. There is definitely an African-American preacher in Jesus there because that's a great line, man. He says, neither here nor there. Okay, so there's. She, and then he says to her, you Samaritans. Now he's getting nasty. Okay, for the moment, Jesus is kind of calling out. He says, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. Circle that. What you do not know. Jesus is calling it like it is. He says, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship, circle, what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Underline the word from. Now, the reason why that's critical, you, oh, you got the little ooh going, didn't you? Because you, do you, do you know why we got the ooh going, right? Because the reality is, is that for a long time, our Jewish friends have loved to misquote Scripture. If you are familiar with any of our Jewish culture and our Jewish friends, they will read this verse and say, we worship what we do know for salvation is for the Jews. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, that is wrong, my friends. The word, the original word is salvation is from the Jews. Who, what, what, is scripture refer, what is Jesus referring to? Who is from the Jews? Who's from the Jews? Jesus. He is from the Jews. What happens is we like to pin things down and make us seem like we're a little bit better. I am not here to pick on our Jewish friends, by no means. Culturally, I would not even attempt to do that. I'm just calling it like it is, and Jesus was too. He was just saying that salvation is from the Jews. He's saying to her, listen, you worship what you do not know. You do not know me, he's saying. But we worship what we do know. You get to know who I am. I am from the Jews. Now watch what he does. He said, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The reality is that Jesus was trying to express to her, I don't care what mountain you think we worship on, and if it's Jerusalem or Jericho, all that matters is that you worship the one who comes from the Jews to you. He offers himself and he says, if you would understand this part of it, you become part of the true worshipers. Again, a lot of people have, have attested to these scriptures. Verses 22 through 24, a lot of denominations, if you're familiar with any of our friends who, 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 uh, who kind of make up their own little denominations, they will take these scriptures and refer to themselves as the true worshipers because they worship God in spirit and in truth. And they try to hold and make this holy, these couple verses only holy, and it is signifying who they are. The reality is Jesus was not pigeonholing anybody. He said it was for all. He said, I have come from the Jews that you might know who I am. And he said, listen, we're not going to worship on this mountain or in there. There's coming a day and it has now come. It has come to you. He is now our soon and coming king. Our king has come. And he was trying to communicate to her. Isn't it interesting? If you read your Bibles, it is one of the very first people Jesus ever tips his hand and tells who he is. Right here in John chapter 4, he meets this woman who's not a disciple. She's not a Jew. She's not a Pharisee's daughter. Not a king's niece. She is simply a woman who's been married and divorced five times. Her life is filled with sin. She is currently making a grave error. And he says, I just want to let you know who I am, and I've come for you. You know what I love about that is that I don't uh, come from royalty. I know a lot of you look at me, and you're like, you know, you must be somebody special. You, I, know, I know how you guys look at me. You're looking at me like, oh, you know, somebody that attractive, that tall, that dark, that handsome. you got to have some blue blood in you, right? Is that what you think? Be honest. I mean, how many, how many of you would agree that you probably think I... Carol, say thank you, honey. Somebody had to raise their hand. Ronnie, you do not believe that. You, what, do you put your thumb down? Is that what you did? Yes. Okay. I am so glad that Jesus sets the example for me, the common folk, the, the, somebody who doesn't have much, somebody who doesn't come from much. I love that he shows that one of the first people he goes to is this woman who doesn't have much, and she doesn't come from much. And he says, I just want to let you in on a secret. I'm who you've been looking for. 
And when you discover me, I'm here now. We can, you can worship me now. Um, there have been times when I've desperately needed a, a God in my life, and I'm glad he meets me where I'm at. Meets me in my sin. Meets me at my lowest hour. Remember what time of the day is she going to the well? It's noon. It is the hottest time of the day. Is she going to a well inside the city or outside the city? Outside the city. What is this well meant for? Is this well meant for water, for drinking, for people, or for animals? And he's there. This is not the well in front of the temple. This is not the well used for the clean drinking water of the priest in preparation for the sacrifices. This is noon, the hottest part of the day, by herself, not what culturally acceptable the women that she would have normally went with. It is Jacob's well, which was used for animals, not for people. It is outside the city gates of Sychar, where she is risking her life to be out there in case of enemy invasions. And that's where he is at. And remember back to the very first verses we read in John chapter 4. He sat down and he waited for her. I am here to tell you tonight that if you have sin in your life, if sin has somehow crept into your life and there is a cycle beginning with you that there is some level of spiritual sinfulness in you, you need not clean yourself first. You need not get yourself fixed. You need not find the right place where you are right now. As lowly as it may be and as obscure as you think you may be hidden from him, he was waiting for you right here tonight. I love that about my Lord. I love that he, um, he was willing to go to a little country church back in 1981 and sat down at a, at a, at a table um, because four young men were going to come to a Sunday school class at 10 a.m. And that Sunday morning in 1981 on February 11th, uh, a wonderful lady was willing to share her heart about she saw some talent in us boys. She saw something that God had placed in us long before we knew it. And she shared the plan of salvation, and we gave our hearts to Christ and confessed our sins. Three of the four of us did. Pastor Lyle was one of those kids. He wasn't a pastor at the time. He was a heathen. He was among the worst Samaritans I've ever met. Um, he would do it two days later. But all four of us boys went to Bible college, and all four of us have served in ministry. Three of us continue to serve. One no longer does. Jesus was waiting for us on February 11th, 1981, in a little country church where less than 30 people attended because four boys needed to find him. Not a one of us had much of a dime to our name. We didn't come from prestige or honor. We just came to church one Sunday morning, and we had no idea how desperately we were in need of a Savior. So I said that to you tonight. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I don't, I don't know where your world is at. I don't know what you've been going through. But I'm telling you right now, do not, do not avoid the moment that Jesus has come to here for you. So John chapter 4, I want to look at verse 10. And I want to compare verse 10 to verses 25 and 26. Because same story, same Jesus, same woman from the well. And I want to show you in scripture how, um, how the process works out when we try to avoid the obvious that there is sin in our life, and Jesus is trying to convict us of it, okay? Uh, and then we're going we're gonna to walk into some other areas here. So it's at the bottom of page 2 for you, the comparison of verse 10 of John chapter 4 to verse 25 and 26. Verse 10 is in the black, and verses 25 and 26 are in the red. It says this, remember, from verse 25 here, the woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ. And then from verse 10 in the black, Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God. So she's saying, I know that when he comes, uh, he's going to be the Messiah. And Jesus is saying, if you only knew, it's me, the gift of God, sitting here. Then in verse 25, second stanza says, she says, is coming. And when he comes, and the second stanza of verse 10, Jesus says, and who it is that asks you for a drink. She's waiting for when he comes, and he's saying, I is who it is. I I'm who you've been waiting for. Then stanza three of verse 25, she says, he will explain everything to us. Stanza three of verse 10, she says, he says, you would have asked him and he would have given you. He say, I'm right here. And she's like, but when he gets here, he's gonna tell us everything we need to know. And then stanza number four of verse 25 and 26, then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. And verse 10, stanza four, she, he says, 
uh, he would have given you this living water. The am he is the living water. Is it not remarkable that we are all the way to verses 25 and 26 of John chapter 4? She has been in the presence of Jesus for some time now. He has told her back in verse 10, I'm everything you need. I'm right here. And we're still dealing with it in verses 25 and 26. She has still found a way around. I will say this to you. I have had people who um, have said to me that in the midst of some severe uh, bouts of sinful uh, lifestyle, I, I wish God would have come to me. I wish I would have seen God in those moments. I begged and cried out for God to come and rescue me, and he never did. And I am here to tell you, that I believe he's never left you abandoned or alone. You have never been anywhere in peril or in success. You've never been anywhere at the height nor at the depth that he has not been there for you. It is only whether or not you see who you're looking for. She clearly here had him in verse 10 in her sights. He's calling it like it is. I am he who you look for. And in verses 25 and 26, she says, when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. I'll wait till that moment. It's, it's very interesting there, and I, I just want to leave it there for right now. We'll come back to page uh, three of this outline. Take your um, little half page, your one page. I want to read for you um, this. I want to make sure we have a good understanding of sin tonight. And the reason why I'm doing this, this may seem fundamental to some, but to others, this may be the first time you've ever had it explained to you well enough to understand what's going on in your life. Because I, I, have we all not been raised enough in church, we're all Christian enough to where we know that we, if we sin, we're to ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins, and then uh, we will be forgiven of our sins. Okay? We're, 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 we've all been there enough, right? But if you've lived long enough, you also have this little grappling. Then why have I not stopped sinning? See, there's some denominations and there's some churches that will teach you and believe very firmly, and which I am ordained in one like that, that will teach you that you can ask for the forgiveness of your sins and be forgiven of them, and you can sin no more. And so I went to a Bible college for four years, and I pastored for almost 15 years in that denomination, struggling with the fact that I did not live that out. And I felt great, um, great criticism, and I felt great personal pain that how is it possible for me to hear and be taught that I can ask for the forgiveness of my sins and no longer sin, and yet I do. What am I missing? How, I, wh 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 where's, the, where's the missing piece? I, I couldn't find it. I, I, I'm, like, I'm like, okay, is there a gear slippage? Did I, did I miss one of the things? And I would go back and read through the theology of what I, what, what I was raised in and what I understood, and, 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 I, and, I, and I couldn't line it up with my own life. Now, you just may be looking at me and go, well, that's because you're a heathen, and that makes sense. So I'm just reading for you, as best I could put down on paper, my understanding from my own personal walk of the destructive cycle of sin explained, okay? And I'll explain it to you in three categories. I'm going to read along with you, and, and I, I've highlighted a few key lines just so you're aware of it. So this may seem boring for a moment, but it will be very educational, I think, for a lot of us. What is sin? Whatever evil that human beings do is sin. Evil that we do. Murder, stealing, hate, greed, jealousy, covetousness, uh, to name a few human acts and attitudes are sinful. These unholy acts and thoughts miss the mark, in quotation, of God's perfect and holy nature. In fact, some of the Hebrew and Greek words for sin contain the idea of missing the bullseye, as it were. I don't want to soft sell sin by saying, well, we missed the mark or we missed the bullseye, but there is, some, uh, there is definitely some uh, valor and weight to that. But sinful acts, uh, uh, paragraph two, but sinful acts or attitudes that fall short of God's perfection are only the symptoms of the presence of true sin. Sin is an internal power that affects everyone's humanness or our human nature. In effect, sin deceives us, enters us, and dominates our existence. Sin enslaves us and takes us over as a drug, enslaves an addict. Sin is like a deadly virus that enters our human nature and takes control of us, using us for its own purpose. Sin repro reproduces itself within us and destroys ourself. And the evil behaviors that result are the symptoms of our inner defectiveness. I just want to say to you, that is the best definition I can give you of what sin is. It's what happens. It's when we know that we were made for more and we accept less. 
It's when we know that we don't want to behave that way, but we do. It's when we crave something that we know is wrong, and it changes who we are because we crave it, okay? Uh, paragraph three. Of course, we can become too ethereal or theological when speaking about our sinful self and lose the simple meaning of what's going on. And so I'm gonna try to break it down in the simplest of terms I can for you. When we say we are sinful, it simply means that we have gross spiritual imperfections in relationship to God. We've missed the perfection of God. Not the perfection of us, but the perfection of God. Here is where the atonement and regeneration come in. Big words, and I'll break the words down for you. Though we are broken spiritually, God has no intention of throwing us away. There are some who have taught us over the years, especially in churches that were very um, uh, um, critical, um, have taught a lot of us that, that if you just keep sinning, God will finally give up on you and throw you away. If you've ever been lied to like that, here and now I call that a lie. I call it bold face out. That is a lie. God will never give up on you, nor will he throw you away. You are not to him anything of refuse. Legalistical churches for too long have implied that if you don't get it right sooner or later, then you are wrong. Do you remember last week's lesson on shame versus guilt? It's exactly what we're talking about. You ought to feel guilty about the sin in your life. Don't let it become shame. Shame is, shame is not where it goes. But for some of us, it has been that way. He wants us to have eternal life in his presence, to be spiritually perfect as he is perfect. To accomplish his purpose, God has to clear away the imperfections, the sinfulness that are part of our human nature. He, we uh, have to be remade, refashioned, regenerated, and spiritually reborn, according to John chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. God has accomplished his pur purpose by first justifying us with himself. That is, he clears the way and forgives us of our sins, past, present, and future. Let me explain. He forgives you of the sins you've done in the past, the sins you've done in the present, and the sins you'll do in the future. God knows that you are not perfect. He knows you are going to sin again, and God is in preparation for your falling and for your failing. God is prepared to forgive you for your future sins doesn't mean that they're already forgiven in advance of him. It just means he's waiting because he knows you are not perfect. Don't you like that? God anticipates we're going to blow it. Why do you think we put training wheels on our kids' bikes when they first learn how to ride? Because you know they're going to fall over. Did the kids ask for training wheels? No. But what do you do as a parent? You're like, you know what? We better get the training wheels out because this nine-month-old is probably not going to make it. I always love the parents. Do you ever have parents like that that want to brag about how good their kids are? My kid's walking. He's two and a half months old. My thing was whenever parents, you, you would go to preschool, and parents would tell you that, my daughter knows how to read her ABCs. She writes her name. She knows how to spell her brother's middle name, and she knows uh, how to do uh, multiplications. And you're like bragging, and she's like three years old. I'm like, my son can operate my lighter for me. He gets a beer out of the fridge, usually for me, the right one. <laughs> Same thing here. Jesus said, I know you're going to blow it. And you're gonna, how do we go there? How, how do we get that far off track? Anybody know? I don't smoke, by the way, and I don't have my child go get a beer out of the fridge. Cool is usually sitting beside me. Anyway, so here it is. I'm joking, people. See, this is why. There it is. That's a sin for a lot of you. Like, I thought so. I can tell he's drinking tonight. Okay, so here he goes. Uh, <laughs> uh, line three there. God purposed to do this through the life and the death of Jesus Christ, who revealed the Father um, and, who was the one, and who was one of the ways in which God revealed himself. Jesus, as God in human flesh, was our perfect sacrifice for our sinful selves. Praise God that he knew the remedy had to be formatted. So now, there is what is sin. We understand what sin is. It's a flaw within us. It's a part of the created nature of our fallen selves, the flesh, okay? And you can't do anything about it on your own. Try as you may. So let's talk about self-justification versus real justification through Christ. Now, why do I talk about this? Because a lot of us try to self-justify. A lot of us try to rationalize why we did what we did and we don't call it sin. We've made it some sort of category in our life that it's okay. There's some things you and I do that you think are okay because you've justified it, and it ain't okay. It is sin, Call a spade a spade. Two plus two is four. Here's a deal. Stop self-justifying and let yourself be justified through Jesus Christ. 
He offers to you the forgiveness of your sins. Let me read this. We've all done it. <laughs> we start when we're children and continue as adults. We do it when uh, we do things we know we shouldn't, things we should feel guilty about, but don't because we feel that it was a good reason. Uh, we had a need uh, that made what we did seem necessary, at least at the time, and it didn't seem to hurt anyone. It's called self-justification, and most of us do it without even noticing. Last paragraph on that page. Self-justification does several things for us. It can help us feel superior to others. <laughs> it can take away our guilt. It helps us feel that we are uh, in the right and what we did was okay. It can give us a sense of security that won't experience any negative consequences. Right? Wrong! Flip your page over. <laughs> I yelled. I yelled because some of you were sleeping, okay? I'll be honest. Not for any theatrical thing. Truth is, uh, you, may not, you may not agree with this, but I, I do. I believe that we get to the point where we do. We self-justify. We start looking at things in our life and we go, that's really not a sin. That's probably not a sin in our life. I mean, that's just something. It's a behavior I have. I need to get that fixed. And the reason why, the reason why I'm talking about self-justification is because we can go so far the other way. Those of us who grew up in legalistical churches and really tightly bound to the fact that everything is sin, we go swing so far the other way where we're like, we want to live out in this free, mamby-pamby world where we can determine what is sin and what is not. There's like the three or four biggies, and everything else is just conditions and, you know, par for the course. No, call, call it like it is. Don't, don't, don't let yourself swing so far over here that we're, you, you lose contact with what God called us to live. He called us to live holy as he is holy. He has called us to rise to his level. Not that we'll ever necessarily here on earth make it there, but we will attain and we will strive. That's what the apostle Paul talked about. Not that I have made it, he says, but one thing I do, I strive for the prize to which I was called through Christ Jesus. There has got to be within us a desire to live holy lives, but not according to legalism, not according to, to law and rules and regulations, but according to relationship. Out of his love for me to die for my sins, my love for him will do everything I can to live for him. So I'm going to call sin, sin. I'm going to see areas in my life, not flaws, not mistakes, but sin, not as judgment, but as justification to say to Jesus, forgive me of those sins that I might not overlook them. So here, let me explain this to you. Self-justification doesn't make us right. It doesn't do anything but give us a false sense of getting away with bad behavior. This is the top of page two. But there is justification that makes us right. R.C. Sproul says this. Justification may, defi may be defined as that act by which unjust sinners are made right in the sight of a just and holy God. Thank goodness that he makes us right. Righteousness means literally to be made right in his sight. When we through faith and faith alone receive justification from God, he declares us free from guilt and acceptable to him. It's not like self-justification wherein we try to make ourselves not look guilty because of our so-called good reasons for sinning. True justification comes by Christ and him alone. It is his righteousness that God imputes or attributes to us not our own. When you ask Christ to come into your life and to forgive you of your sins, he justifies you. He makes you right. Um, it is though we look in a mirror and our faces were muddy and we take the washcloth and clean our face off. It is now clear the image is the same. The beauty of justification is he accepts the dirt and takes it away. That's what his death on the cross did for us. He, he died so that he might forgive us of our sins. His blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Um, there's a need for us to understand that his death was for us. He suffered a pain for us. That's not to put you in some sort of box and make you feel guilty and terrible. It's to tell you he loved you that much. I don't know of anybody who's ever died for me other than Jesus. A lot of good men and women have gone to war to provide for me freedom to live here in America. But specifically for me, only one has ever died for me and for you. And it was Jesus Christ so that you might be made right in his sight. Mm. So here's repentance and I'll explain it to you. And then, uh, and then we'll do one thing and we'll be done. It is, common, it is a common mistake for Christians to think of repentance as ceasing to sin. Did you hear me? 
It is common for Christians to think of repentance as ceasing to sin. If we had really repented, you wouldn't have done it again, is a refrain uh, many tormented souls have heard from well-meaning, law-upholding spiritual counselors. We are told that repentance is to turn from God and go the other way, and it is explained in the context of turning away from sin and turning to, toward a life of obedience to God's law. Nothing wrong with any of that, by the way. That is all good stuff, right? The only problem with it is it leaves with it this air of perfection. With that in, uh, idea firmly in mind, Christians set out with the best intentions to change their ways. But along the way, uh, some ways change and some ways seem to stick like super glue. And even uh, the ways that change have a nasty way of cropping up again. Is God satisfied with such medi mediocrity, such hit and miss obedience? No, he is not. The preacher exhorts uh, and the vicious gospel crippling cycle of commitment failure and despair takes another spin around the going nowhere rat uh racetrack of futility do you like my words <laughs> so we crank up the commitment jalopy and go at it again with the same miserable uh, predictable results and our frustration and despair deepens because we realize that our turning away from sin is anything but complete because here's the deal i'm not saying to you that it's a daily process of repenting from your sins but we live in a fallen world, and I'm not giving you a license to sin by any means. I don't want anybody to walk out and go, well, praise Jesus. Pastor John said we can just live like demons all day long because that's just what we're made to be. No, 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 no. I want you to understand the great sacrifice he made that we might have the ability to repent of our sins. But if, if you're trying to figure out why have you asked God to forgive you of sin in an area and you keep sinning in that area, it has little to do with your repentance, and it has to do with your behavior. Your behavior has to start to change here soon. See, we blame it all on God and say, well, God must not have forgiven me of my sins, or I must not be good enough, or somehow we again take on shame. And the reality is it's part of maturity. It's part of the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. There have been sins that I have committed in my life that have not been resolved under the prayer of repentance because I needed the power of the Holy Spirit to help me. I needed something more. I needed to move to the next level and allow God to have a greater part of who I was. The only reason why sin ran rampant in my life after asking for forgiveness of it is because I wasn't giving it over to God. I'd hand it to him and keep a little piece of the corner and hang on in case I wanted it back. True repentance is when you truly let go of it all. But see, we crank up this jalopy, this machine to try to get us clunking forward, and we wonder why we fail. I've met a lot of good people who live uh, below standard moral lives today because they couldn't kick that one or two sins in their life. They couldn't figure out how to get that to fix and work right. And because it never did, they just gave up. Beautiful lady that I've been emailing for the last couple of weeks has been communicating to me this struggle she's had for 13 years with a sin in her life. And I've been trying to express to her that she has not sacrificed yet her whole life to him. She is holding back something, whether she recognizes it or not, and she has not relented to the power of the Holy Spirit. Your act of repentance, if it, 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 turning away from sin, you can turn away from sin and do a 180, and you can do a 180 right back into sin. I can spin halfway around as easy as I can spin all the way around. So if you wonder why you're struggling tonight with a reoccurring sin in your life, it's because you're not doing a half a turn, you're doing a full turn. When he says in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, uh, to repent, therefore, of your sins and experience times of refreshing from the Lord, to repent means to turn around and walk away, not just turn around. You need to get away from those things that are causing sin in your life. If it is a behavior, if it is an attitude, if, if it is a mindset, you need to start walking in the other direction, my friends, and don't stop until you get out. Sometimes you need to be escorted out of places, and I mean in the right way. I mean by the Holy Spirit's power to give you the strength and ability to go out through there. So a lot of us struggle with, man, why can I not kick the habit? Why do I still struggle in that area with sin? Why, why do I find myself so prone to gossip? Why, 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 am I, why am I led to envy so much? Why is my anger rage to the point of sin? Why does that happen to me? Why don't I do that? Because you're not working on the rest of it. Okay. Repent. 
and believe the gospel. Jesus declares in Mark chapter one, verse 15, repentance and faith mark the beginning of our new life in the kingdom of God. They don't mark it because we did the right thing. They mark it because that is when the scales fall off our darkened eyes and we see at last in Jesus Christ the glorious light of the liberty uh, of the sons of God. There is a point when you finally see it for what it is and you call it like it is and you're like, that is sin and I'm moving away from it as quickly as I have. It's the illustration I just gave to you. Everything that ever needed to be done for our human forgiveness and salvation has already been done through the death and resurrection of the Son of God. There was a time when we were in the dark but uh, about that. We couldn't enjoy it or rest in it because we were blind to it. Listen, Jesus did everything you need for the forgiveness of your sins. There are no more hoops. There are no more hurdles for him to go through. It is done. It is prepared for you. You just need to receive it. Last paragraph. In other words, God gave us good news. The good news is that he has personally paid the heavy price for all our selfish, rebellious, destructive, evil lunacy. He has freely saved us, washed us, purified us, dressed us in his righteousness, and set a place for us in the eternal banquet table. And through this word of the gospel, he invites us to trust him so that it is so. I'm here to tell you right now that we are missing out on what God has for us because we are living below the standard he has expected for us. Um, Sin is simple in its origin, nearly impossible to shake if you try it on your own. Praise God that that's why when he went to the woman at the well, this is why I share this with you, he went there and sat and waited for her. And so at that moment when he began to have the conversation, remember, he walked her through her physical separation while she was there at noon. He walked her through the emotional shame that she had because of her condition of her divorces. And now he is here spiritually with her and he's engaging. He wants her to know, I'm here. I I won't let you go any further on your own in this process. I've stuck with you through this the physical and the emotional, and I'll be here through the spiritual. Do you know what I know? The destructive cycle often sees itself plagued by the emotional. We see all this baggage in our mind, but the thing that, that kicks this thing into order and it begins to spin out of control, the destructive cycle, is often back to the spiritual. We're made to be spiritual beings. We're made to have a spiritual sense. God breathed his life into us, which means his spirit into us. We're spiritual people. It's why we're drawn to God. It's why you come out tonight. It's why you come to church on Sunday. It's why you get the goosebumps when the pastor talks. It's why when, when certain notes are hitting songs, that, 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 that on the back of your neck you just feel that feeling and, and, you're, and your, your heart lifts and you feel lighter and you feel better. It's why a smile comes across your face and tears come out of your eyes at moments in worship services and, and when somebody's speaking and, 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 and those powerful moments. We're spiritual people. And so with the great radiance of our spiritual life also comes this great spiritual battle. The devil is constantly trying to take us down. But here's the deal. He cannot win. He must not win. Because we hold the key. All we have to do is call out to Jesus. He watches and looks over us and sees our condition. Let me show you this story. It's in, your, it's in your page three at the bottom. We're gonna come back to that next week at the top, verses 28 through 30. I'll finish that next week, but look at this story, the destructive cycle of sin. Jesus heals a paralytic. Here's Matthew chapter nine, verses one through eight. Look at the eyes of Jesus and what he sees when he sees us. Verse one says this, John chapter, or Matthew chapter nine, verses one through eight. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Now I'm gonna show you the cycle here. Verse two, some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. So here's what I refer to as the emotional shamefulness. Uh, The man's been on the mat. I'm just going to imply that being a paralytic and having to be brought somewhere by his friends has incurred upon him some issues emotionally, okay? I don't see this guy being a happy-go-lucky buddy. We, We talked about it with every one of these stories. As you evaluate it, you begin to see that emotionally there's some damage when you have this paralysis. He's a paralytic, folks. Uh, in this culture, he's been, extra, he's been uh, removed from his family's home, most likely. He is now a beggar. Uh, he doesn't really have much more than his mat. Uh, he's probably living outside the city walls. Uh, he doesn't have much contact with any people. I mean, I mean he's, he's barely surviving. He's been called some things. Some judgments have been made over him. He has been referred to less than. The word paralytic is also referred to as invalid. We talked about the word invalid. Break it down. Invalid is invalid, meaning of no value. And so they bring him, and he's on his mat, and they lay him down. We see this, verse 2, part B, when Jesus saw whose faith? Their faith. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to them? No, who do you talk to? To the paralytic. i got to read that again. 
When Jesus saw their faith, the men carrying him, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. May I say to you, never give up on somebody who may need you to carry them to get to Jesus. There are people in my life who, um, who I, uh, I'm constantly trying to get in contact with Jesus because they desperately need him. And uh, they may need to be carried to get to him. Uh, God honors our faith. He sees our faith. Uh, we just got to get him as close as possible. Now, this is, I don't want you to twist this too far, okay? But what I want to show you is you may need to help some people get as close to Jesus as you can. He's got to do the work. They got to they they accept it. They got to believe in Jesus. But let us not stop trying our best to get him there. So it's just interesting. I, I, I don't know how to explain it any better than this. It's when he saw their faith, it doesn't say the faith of the paralytic. I don't know if the there includes him. He said to the paralytic, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Uh, what's wrong with him? What's this man's original condition? He's paralyzed, right? Do you not find it interesting? What did Jesus do? Did he deal with the fact that he was paralyzed? He says, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. He comes to Jesus, uh, and the first address is not the fact that he's paralyzed. Jesus is addressing a sin issue. Where's my little marker? He's obviously got a physical problem. We've already identified the fact that because of the physical problem, there's probably some shame. Jesus, right off the bat, addresses the spiritual issue. He forgives him of his sins. Now, does it mean because you're paralyzed, you're a sinner? No, because I believe Jesus sees uh, to the core of who we are. Back to the woman at the well, the reason why I'm sharing this story with you. Back to the woman at the well. He knew more was going on. Do you remember the story I used with you last week about the, the woman who reached out and touched the hem of Jesus' garment? Do you remember that when Jesus looked around and, uh, and the forgiveness of her, uh, you know, her sins and how Jesus addressed her? He called her what? What did he call her when, when he healed her completely? Daughter. What does he call this gentleman? Son. Remember when she touched him, the scripture says, of the woman who touched him in garments, it says that she was freed from her suffering. And immediately the bleeding stopped. So physically she was healed. But it wasn't until five verses later when Jesus says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. It is then the bleeding stopped, but then he went ahead and freed her from her other suffering. We see here that Jesus, seeing the physical problem, doesn't deal with that first. He says, take heart, my son. We need to be a part of a family. Your sins are forgiven. He addresses the sin issue first. That's why I tell you that, that if, if you don't get this thing fixed down here, folks, this cycle continues to run out of control. First thing he addresses is a sin issue. Now, verse 3, at this, at this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blaspheming. I see him as British. I'm sorry. Knowing their thoughts, I, <laughs> would you like to have that gift? Knowing their thoughts, that would be the coolest thing. To know what you're thinking right now. Maybe I do. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, verse 4, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Can you imagine? <laughs> he knows what you were thinking. Verse 5, which is easier? I like Jesus. He's given like this. Like, like on Sunday when I showed you that little math trick about that we all have the same problem, but we also get the same answer. Jesus was into the same thing. If you criticize me for my great math skills, uh, verse 5, Jesus says, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? Which would be easier? But so that you may know that the Son of God has authority on earth to do what? Forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, get up, take your mat, and go home. Here's the power of what Jesus does. He has already forgiven him of his sins in verse 2. And so down here, Jesus messing with him says, which is tougher, to say forgive you of your sins or to, make, or, or, or to have you get up and walk? And he says, just so you know I have the power to forgive sins, get up and walk. Because he had already forgiven him of his sins. Jesus just messing with them, just showing them I can do it all right in front of you. I love that about him. Nothing stops. So now the man is physically well. Up here his sins are forgiven, but now he gets up and takes his mat and goes home. He's physically well. So Jesus deals with the spiritual. Now the physical is happening, and, and we know the emotional. He dressed the fact he's paralyzed, and then he says, verse 7, and the man got up and went home. 
He gets to go home. The word home here in the original Greek in verse 7 means his home, his family's home, a home he has not been to since he's probably been paralyzed. That's why it denotes the home. In verse 8 it says, when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe. They praised God uh, who had been given such authority over men. I love that about the story here because in reality, that's our story. So here's the deal. You want to know the destructive cycle can be, can be broken. But I'm saying to you tonight, if there's sin in your life, it's 827, you've got three minutes to get this right. I wish somebody would just start humming just as I am. If we could have that right now. Mm-hmm. I don't know how it goes. Mm-hmm. Just as I am. Okay, there it is. Um, <laughs> okay, that doesn't sound good either. It sounds like cats dying outside my house. I want you to know in all seriousness with two minutes left uh, tonight. Th- <laughs> Are you humming it? Stop, now it's distracted me. Because <laughs> I'll be thinking about that. I want to sing. Uh, the truth of the matter is, as I wanted you to see another story, how it parallels the woman at the well that Jesus is always articulating this destructive cycle with people as he's working through. I want you to start reading scripture. Uh, Go ahead to Mark chapter 9 tonight sometime and look at um, uh, Bartimaeus, the man who laid beside the road. It's in, I think it's in uh, Mark chapter 9 and Luke chapter, I think, 14. There's a story of Bartimaeus. If you just do some research, you'll find the story of Bartimaeus. Look up that story and see how Jesus dealt with Bartimaeus. You'll see the destructive cycle, the same thing. He's dealing with the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. I'm here to tell you right now, what happens to a lot of us is we come to Christ through the spiritual. We want the forgiveness of our sins, but we never allow him to heal where we're socially separated and deal where we have some psychological shame and other emotional baggage. Let him destroy the destructive cycle in our lives so that we might live lives free to the greatest of our ability to glorify him. Remember I told you on Sunday, did I not tell you, Jesus said in John chapter 11, verse 40, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God. That's all he wants us to do is live free lives, destroying the destructive cycle. Thank you for joining us at The Core at Westside Community Church. The Core meets on Wednesday nights at Westside at 7 p.m. 